Hello students. So now we're going to look at shifts in demand. We talked about market basics earlier and we also talked about the demand curve. Now we'll see when does the demand curve shift. Now one thing to be very careful about is distinguishing between a shift in a demand curve versus a movement along the demand curve. So movement along will look something like this. It's still the same curve, you're just switching to a different point on it. A shift means you're jumping from one curve to a different curve. They're not the same. A lot of mistakes in analysis that come at the principles level come from confusing movements along with shifts. So this section here is a very big deal. Pay close attention. So a price change always gives you a movement along the demand curve. So let's say the price starts out at five dollars or buying five units over here. So if price were to drop to two dollars consumers respond to that by buying more. That's just our friend, the law of demand. Remember, when price goes down, people buy more. That causes us to move to this different point on the same demand curve. Now, if price were to snap back to $5, if the sale were to end, people would go right back to where they started. So you're still on the same curve. So price changes always give you movements along. When a goods price changes, that does not shift the curve. So what does shift the curve? Well, that's when something other than price changes. It turns out that there's a lot of factors other than price that can influence a market. So your book gives a list. One factor is income. That can affect people's willingness to buy stuff. Related goods can also change people's willingness to buy their demand curve. So if a good that's similar changes in its price or quantity, that can influence another market. So for example, changes in the market for hot dogs can affect the market for hot dog buns and vice versa. Consumer tastes can also cause demand to shift. So a good might come into fashion or might go out of fashion. That can shift demand. People also think about their expectations about price. If you expect price to rise in the future or expect price to fall in the future, that can influence your demand today. Changes in the number of buyers can also affect things. So for example, with the coronavirus, a lot of people wanted to move out of big cities and into more rural areas because that's where the outbreak was not quite so bad. Because people can often work from home in some jobs, that became a possibility. So as a result, you see changes in real estate markets in urban and rural areas the rural areas are gaining more buyers and the urban areas are losing buyers. Taxes also affect demand. We do have a separate chapter on taxation, so mostly for this chapter just add it to our list, but we'll go more in depth on that later on. That'll be in this group of chapters that talk about government interventions in the market. So. To drive home what factors give you shifts versus movements along, I found a nice example in another textbook that I'll share with you guys. So let's just go back to some basic math where you have a straight line. The line has the equation y equals mx plus b. b is the intercept, so that's where the line crosses the y-axis. 
the slope is m. You know, slope, of course, is rise over run. So we change the variables that are on the axes. We change x, we change y. That just gives you a different point on the same curve. So if you change x from this x to that one over here, it's still the same line, has the same slope, has the same intercept. So intercept. So it's the same line, just going to a different point on it. Likewise, if you were to change y from this y to that y, you're just picking a different point on the same curve. You still have the same intercept and still have the same slope. So the general lesson there is that if you change a variable that's on the axis of a graph, that gives you a movement along the curve. So in economics, we put price and quantity on our axes. So, um, so you have price on the y-axis and you have Q on the x-axis. So changing X or changing Y is like changing price or changing quantity. Those are axis variables. So that gives you movements along the same curve, does not shift the curve. Now, if you change a variable that is not on the axis, that's when you get shifts. So in our equation for a line, we have Y equals MX plus B. X and Y are on the axes, so those other two variables, m and b, are not. So if I change m or change b, that gives me a shift. So my first graph here, I changed b, I lowered b to b prime, that shifts my intercept down, and that's going to drag down my entire curve. In my second graph, I changed the slope m, I made it steeper, so that caused the curve to shift, it caused it to pivot around this point B. So we're seeing that if you change a variable on the axes, you move along the same curve. If you change a variable that's not on the axes, that shifts the curve. So in economics, because you have price and quantity on the axes, these other variables, these things other than price and quantity, with things like income and consumer taste, all those things that I listed out here. So all these things are not on the axes. That's why they can shift demand. Now you might be wondering, isn't price on the axes? Yes, but price expectations, expected price, is not. Price and price expectations are not quite the same thing. The price as it currently is today and the price you expect it to be in the future could be two different numbers. So if you have that principle in your head, you can avoid a lot of mistakes in analysis. So here's our list of factors. We'll go through them one by one with the exception of taxation, which we'll save for a future chapter. Let's talk about income first. So most goods are what we call normal goods. The definition of a normal good is one that you buy more of when you have higher income, all else equal. It also means that if you have an income drop, you're going to buy less of the normal good, all else equal. So it's called a normal good for a reason because it is the normal case. Most goods fall into that category. The usual example in economics courses is restaurants. So if the economy goes into a recession and people lose income, you have to start looking for things in your budget that, what do I not really need? Oftentimes when people do that, going out to restaurants is the first thing you cut. Do you make food at home more cheaply? So that's a pretty easy thing to drop from your budget. So when income falls, restaurants are often pretty hard hit. Demand for restaurants is going to drop. You can see if for any price, there's a smaller quantity of demand than there was in the past. So when the price is out here, we used to buy this much, but now we're only gonna buy that amount instead. 
On the other hand, when incomes go up, when the economy is booming, people often celebrate by going back to restaurants. So they really enjoy the good times quite a bit, but the bad times recessions hit them pretty hard. It's a very volatile industry. So then income's going, then um, income's going to cause demand to shift out and demand is going to be up here instead of being back there. Now the opposite kind of good is what we call an inferior good. Those are ones that you actually buy less of when you have more income. All else equal, ceteris paribus, that phrase we used earlier. Or we used ceteris paribus to mean all else equal back in chapter two. So likewise, when your income goes down, you start buying more of goods that are inferior goods. So the classic example of that is ramen noodles. College students often don't have a lot of income. As a result, ramen noodles could be an important part of your diet. Now, once you graduate from college and find a decent job, then you'll be able to afford nicer food. So when your income goes up, you're going to start buying less ramen noodles. We showed over here on the second graph. You get richer, and then you start buying less ramen noodles. Now, if you were to lose that job you got through college, if the economy goes into recession again or something like that, then you're poor again, and you start going back to buying ramen noodles. In that case, your demand curve would shift out like it does in this graph over here. So income can shift demand. Another thing that can shift demand is what we call related goods. And there are two kinds of related goods. So related goods can be either substitutes or complements. We say goods are complements if you tend to buy them together. So things like hot dogs and hot dog buns are complements. Buying buns without buying a hot dog doesn't make a lot of sense and so does buying hot dogs without a bun. So you get them together. With substitutes, you tend to buy one good or the other, but you don't buy both. Macs and PCs are substitutes. You want to have one computer. If you have a PC already, you don't need a Mac. If you have a Mac already, you don't need a PC you're probably not going to have both a Mac and a PC. So they're substitutes. Now, related goods can influence demand. So a change in the market for hot dogs can affect the market for buns. A change in the market for Macs can affect the market for PCs. Now, to be clear, we're not violating the principle we had earlier. We said a change in a goods price gives you a movement along the demand curve. However, the change in a related goods price can shift the demand curve. So in the market for hot dogs, the price of hot dogs is on the axis there. So that gives you a movement along in the market for hot dogs. But the price of hot dogs is not on the axis for the market for buns. In the market for buns, we put the price of buns on the axis, not the price of hot dogs. So the price of hot dogs is not an axis variable. Changes in variables that are not on the axis, we said, give you shifts. So if hot dogs get more expensive or get cheaper, that moves you along the graph in the hot dog market, but shifts the demand in the bun market. So let's work through an example. Let's stick with hot dogs and hot dog buns. Let's say that hot dogs get more expensive. So when that happens, what's going to happen to the market for buns? Is demand going to shift out like in graph A? Or is demand going to shift back like in graph B? So go ahead and pause the video here and think about it. When you're ready, press play and we'll talk about the answer. 
All right, I'll assume you've given this some thought. So when hot dogs get more expensive, we'll first figure out what happens to the market for hot dogs. What does the law of demand tell us? The law of demand says that when something gets more expensive, we buy less of it. So the price of hot dogs goes up, consumers are going to start buying fewer hot dogs. Now the whole point of buying a bun is to have a hot dog to go along with it. So if you're buying fewer hot dogs because hot dogs got more expensive, now you don't need as many buns. As a result, demand for buns is going to shift back. So which graph looks like shifting back? Well, in graph A, we're buying more buns, so that's not making sense. Graph B, we're buying fewer buns, so that means demand is shifting back. That is going to be the right answer. So when hot dogs get more expensive, consumers buy fewer hot dogs. As a result, they also start buying fewer hot dog buns. So graph B is the right answer. So that's how that example works. Let's look at another example. So we said Macs and PCs are substitutes. We'll look at how changes in the market for Macs influence PCs. Let's say that Macs get more expensive. What's that going to do to PCs? Will a PC market look like graph C over here, or will it look like graph D? So give that some thought. Pause the video here, and when you're ready, press play. So we'll work through this in a similar manner. We'll first think about what does the law of demand tell us about the market for max. So if max get more expensive, law of demand implies that we're going to buy fewer max. People buy less of things when they get more expensive. So Macs and PCs are substitutes. We still want to have a computer. We just have to figure out, will our computer be a Mac or a PC? Because we're buying fewer Macs, that computer we're going to buy is less likely to be a Mac. So we're going to get a computer, and it's not going to be a Mac, then it's probably going to be a PC. So we're going to start buying more PCs. That means demand for PCs should shift out. In graph C, demand is shifting out. So graph C should be the correct answer. So that's how you work through these related goods problems. So you first look at what does the law of demand tell me for the original good. Then you figure out how it's going to influence the market for the related good. So that's how income and related goods influence demand. We'll stop this episode here. In our next episode, we'll talk about the other factors.